at the WSO conference. This is Jennifer Miller, and Jennifer is an expert in endocrinology. And we're going to ask you some questions about endocrinology and also some nutrition questions perhaps at the end. Can you tell us whether growth hormone improves cognitive development for adults? It does. Um, so there's been some, some data showing that both for children and adults, growth hormone improves cognitive development no matter what age you start it at. Um, so um, it improves working memory, it improves verbal skills in everyone, but definitely there has been some data to show that it not only improves cognitive development in adults, but may even prevent possibly early dementia, which can be part of part of So some, some of our members have got teenagers like, mm -hmm. and, and also 19, 20, 25 years who never had growth hormone. Right. Is that if they started it, is that still it would be could helpful? still be very helpful. Absolutely. The oldest person I've started on growth hormone was 45. Right. Um, because it still has positive effects. Okay. So okay. That's, that's good. Yeah. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Our second question question is on thyroid function. So a thyroid test that showed that someone's levels were borderline or low, would you would you then suggest that they had um, any treatment for that? I was going to say, I know the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer is if the levels are low, I would treat, okay? Even if they um, weren't showing Even if symptoms. they had no clinical symptoms at all, because, I mean, there's no way they have no clinical symptoms of hypothyroidism right. if they have broader release syndrome. I mean, the clinical symptoms of hypothyroidism, constipation, fatigue, you know, cold intolerance. I mean, they're, they're just common symptoms in the general population and especially in people with broader release syndrome. So I, I would find it hard to imagine that there's not a person out there that doesn't have some clinical <laughs> symptoms of low thyroid, you know? Um, and so I would say that, yes, if the numbers are low, I would absolutely treat. Now, if the numbers are on the low side of normal, but still normal, then I probably would not treat right at that moment as long as they were in the normal range and the person was without clinical symptoms. If they develop clinical symptoms, then of course you treat, but if they don't, you just keep an eye on the levels and you don't need to treat in the absence of any clinical symptoms and levels that are in the range of normal. Does that make sense? Yeah, in New Zealand, majority of our kids and adults with PWS have never had a thyroid test in their life because it's not given to us. So is that something you feel we should be pushing for? Absolutely. It should be done in little kids, like under three, it should be done at least twice a year. And in anybody older than three, I think it should be done at least annually or if they develop any symptoms consistent with that. And those symptoms, what parents are we looking for? Easy weight gain, constipation, fatigue. Um, cold intolerance. Um, those are the most good. Dry skin, hair falling out. Right. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Thank mm -hmm. you. And the are they measuring against the normal population, or is there yes. a measure for probability? No, it's the normal population. It's the normal population. Mm -hmm. Okay. And cool. there are age standards for the normal population. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. really good. Uh, next up, the growth hormone dose. Uh, we're going to ask you about. So. If IGF-1 is above normal, then you mentioned that that shouldn't be so much of a concern because it's not um, an accurate indicator of uh, the what the growth hormone uh, level should be for the injection? Sort of. So, um, so IGF-1 in nutritional phases 2A and 2B goes up above the normal range, and we know that. And it happens because that's when insulin is starting to go up postprandially after meals and so that insulin cross reacts with the IGF-1 assay and it also binds to the IGF-1 receptor and so you can get these high levels of IGF-1 during those times that are not real levels of what the growth hormone dose is doing they're they're more it's assessing you know growth hormone plus insulin so you're not getting a very accurate level of what the actual growth hormone dose is doing to the person so the best way to get an accurate level in kids of that age is to do an IGF-1 and also measure the binding protein for it which is called IGF BP3 and there's a ratio that you can do between IGF-1 and IGF BP3 that will then basically give you the amount of free IGF-1 or what the growth hormone is actually doing to the IGF-1 in the blood and then you can and there are norms for age again for age and gender so that you can take them that ratio number and compare it right. to what's the normal for the age and, and sex and be able to tell is the growth hormone dose appropriate or not. 
I think if you're only going to be able to do IGF-1, which some countries can only do that yeah. measure, and if that's the case, you have to also look at the child clinically. If the IGF-1 is high, are there any signs of overgrowth in that child that would say to you that's really high and I should lower the dose of growth hormone or it's probably not real and we should leave the dose of growth hormone alone. And so those signs would be really, you know, super excessive growth, very long fingers, a chin growing excessively, mm. um, head growing All excessively, right. you know, things that would indicate a growth hormone overdose. That's those it. are the things that, that you would say, oh, okay, maybe this is actually a real number. Right. But in 99.99% .99 of cases, that's not what you see at that point. You see a typical kid that's growing fine, but not excessively, and the, because the growth hormone dose is really not too high, it's just because you're measuring the mm. insulin and, as part of the assay. That's really good to Great know. answer, thank mm -hmm. you. How long is, have you been doing these tests and the, the combination of IGF-1 and the IGF binding protein? 15, 20 years. Oh, a long time. Yeah, a long time. Wow. Yeah, a long it's time. It's been around for a long time. Can we ask if we can't get those tests? I mean, in New Zealand, is there a way that we could get them privately overseas? Or anything I like don't that? know. I, I mean, yeah. I'm sure like any lab, like LabCorp or Quest yeah. or Esoterics, or like, which is the endocrine main, you know, sort of endocrine yeah. lab, they'll do them. I mean, any lab it's just can maybe do, them. do it it's privately. Just, yeah, exactly. And okay. so, yeah, you know, so we started doing them because we were seeing those IGF ones going right. up. Yeah. And, and back at the first expert meeting of Prader Willi, which was like 2004, we, um, we were talking about this and how it's not a reliable indicator of the growth hormone dose. And, and so, but nobody at the time knew it was insulin. We just knew it couldn't be accurate. Like we're not changing the dose mm. and the numbers are going up. So it just didn't make sense, you know? And, and that's when we started doing it was at that point because we had this long discussion with all the endocrinologists like mm. should we just not do it if it's not accurate we all know it's not accurate why yeah. are we doing it because yeah. all it's doing is making us think about pushing down a growth hormone dose which means losing the positive effects of the growth hormone why would you want to do and that and that is happening yeah. with some people I know that right. IGF-1 levels have gone too high and mm -hmm. so they, therefore they've been told to reduce their GH or actually not give them GH right. and right. to stay off it for a couple of months which Right, you know, exactly. You so, don't want to miss yeah, the benefits of it. Exactly. You know? and so so yeah. I think that's really important information to know. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Now you mentioned something during your presentation about insulin and, and its effect on weight gain, which mm -hmm. I found interesting. And I wonder whether you'd just be able to relay that to our, our audience in mm -hmm. terms of insulin and its unique effect um, on Prada Willy sufferers, uh, and also perhaps some strategies to try and minimise that. So, so it's actually not unique to Prada Willy. Um, it is unique to women over 40 and people with Prada Willy syndrome. Oh, wow. There you go. But no, it's also, I mean, it's, it's anyone truly who has insulin resistance, but it becomes more common in people, women over 40, particularly as our estrogen and progesterone values change as we start to go through perimenopause. And in Prada Willy, it's just there from the beginning, something genetically causes it. We think, just, I mean, we think hypothetically that it is because there's abnormal insulin receptors in the hypothalamus. When the hypothalamus is formed abnormally in utero that the insulin receptors are just not normal either in number or in function and so you get this false like insulin resistance that then just sort of skyrockets over time. Mm. Anyway, so that high insulin level, every time you eat, that um, that you're gonna raise your insulin. So if you eat a simple carb or an artificially sweetened something, um, then um, then what will happen is the insulin will go way high. Um, high like somebody who's pre-type 2 diabetes. And that causes weight gain. So if you talk to people who have diabetes, or pre-diabetes, what they'll tell you is I'm always hungry, I never feel full, no matter what I eat. 10 minutes after I eat a meal, I'm hungry again. I want to go back in my kitchen. And and that's the same thing, right? I mean, it's all there. Mm -hmm. It's just that that it took us a while to recognize that this is one of the things that was going on in Prada Willie. And to be honest with you, what I think, personally, what I think happens is that insulin is well known in type 2 diabetes to sort of block up the blood brain barrier so that satiety signals can't get through, like leptin. So you, when you're obese, you make a lot of leptin. But you make a lot of leptin because your body's trying to tell your brain, like, we have enough body fat, stop <laughs> eating. But it can't get through. The message can't get through. And the same thing happens in Prada Willie. Over time, that high insulin starts to block up the blood-brain barrier right. from letting the leptin through and letting the other satiety signals through. 
and then you can't feel full. So it's, that's why it's that gradual progression right. of weight gain and then increased appetite and then right. really not feeling full. And it's the same thing that happens in anybody with insulin resistance. But but the weight gain, oh, I, what I was going to say is people with pre-diabetes will tell you they can't lose weight no matter what they do. And you know why they can't? Because they're drinking diet sodas instead of regular sodas. Not that regular sodas are good either, but the diet sodas, the sweet taste will cause that same insulin rise. And so you don't ever get improvement in the insulin levels by making that change, if that makes sense. And that's a change we tell a lot of people with obesity and pre-diabetes mm -hmm. to make, right? We say, okay, well, you know, just drink water. Well, I don't like water. Well, I'll drink a diet soda instead of a regular soda, you know I mean? So, okay. uh -huh. In terms of um, trying to mitigate that rise in, in insulin, then could you talk about the types and amount of carbohydrates that people should be having with yes. their meal? And you also mentioned one thing in your presentation that was really important about people being too drastic and withdrawing carbohydrates completely from their child's diet. Right. And the negative effects that could have as well. Right. So so let's start with that one. So when people completely take out carbohydrates from their kid's diet and they'll say, well, they get carbs from vegetables. Well, that's not the same thing as getting a good complex carb um, that has fiber in it, you know. And so those kids, if you see them and feel them, they're very squishy. Okay, because they have to use the protein and the fat in their diet to grow and for energy, they cannot make muscle. There's no protein left to make muscle, so they're squishy. And we don't want squishy, we want normal, you know? And so by removing the carbs from the diet completely like that, you take away the ability to make muscle, which means then that it's much harder for your child to exercise and be physically active because they don't have as much muscle, and it just can spiral from there. So let me just clarify that. Yeah. You mean because they don't have carbohydrate in their diet, that's not giving them the energy to exercise, which would be an increased muscle mass. No, mass. it's because they don't have carbohydrate in their diet, they um, have to use the protein for energy. And so if you're using all your protein for energy, you cannot use your protein to make muscle. Great. To build muscle, yeah. So I mean, it probably works both ways, but, but I think that more importantly, what we see is when we add carbs into the diet, complex carbs, you start to see that yeah. muscle building, you yeah. know, because all of a sudden now you have that substrate yeah. of carbohydrates to use for energy, yeah. and you can then use the protein yeah. for what it's intended to be used for, which is to build muscle. So, um, you know, ideally it should be, and every kid is different, you know, but we, we recommend a fairly low balanced diet with, you know, basically 30% protein, 30% fat, 40% carbs. Those carbs have to be complex. Which uh -huh. Sorry, when you break down the percentages there, it's important for people to understand you're talking about the caloric uh, percentages, or are you talking about the amount on your plate? The amount on the plate. Okay, great. The amount on the plate. So for yeah. someone looking at on your, uh, on your plate, that was 30% uh -huh. carbohydrate. 30% fat, 30% protein. But the fat is a little bit more difficult, so it gets a little bit trickier there. So let me, so when we look at a plate, what we say is, you know, we want as much vegetables as you want as long as they're not starchy vegetables um, green vegetables you can have as much as you want if they're starchy that counts as your carbohydrate okay um, and so we try to not do too much starches all together the starch portion should be the size of the child's fist um, or what would fit flat on the palm of the child's hand okay so that means if you're taking how old is your child again four five, five four or five yeah. yeah so his hand you know is little right and so if you're taking his hand and a piece of good nutty seedy whole grain brown bread to give him a portion that would probably be realistically a quarter of a slice of bread is a portion size for him right because that's what would fit flat on the palm of his hand with beans legumes you know quinoa couscous that would be the size of his fist is the serving size so to me it's more practical than actually measuring and trying to do that percentage yeah. even though i say it like yeah. In real life, I think it's so much easier to just say, okay, let's see how this compares to the size of your fist. And, and okay, well, that's a little bit too much. Mommy's going to take some off, you know, or whatever, you know. So, and then with the fat, what you can do is you can take a little bit of olive oil and drizzle it over your complex carbs. So you can, you know, do right brown rice and beans um, and do a little bit of olive oil over there. And that has got your protein your fat and your complex carb. And the beans count for both, actually, for both a, a complex carb and a protein, but you can do them both. And then a green vegetable. And you've got your plate, you know. So we say, like, for breakfast, we want something like, you know, an egg or um, an egg with vegetables or cheese in it or something like that. So the egg's got the fat and the protein. Um, and then we always want a veggie or fruit with each meal. The fruit, though, can only be twice a day. And so, and again, it's the size of either the child's fist, if it's like an apple or something like that, or what would fit flat in the child's hand. So, you know, the blueberries or a cut up strawberry or whatever, how much would fit flat in the palm of their hand. And it's never juice. 
ever. It's always the whole fruit. <laughs> um, because the whole fruit has a lot of benefits that juice doesn't have. It's got fiber, it's got all this other stuff that delays that insulin rise when you eat a piece of fruit versus when you drink the juice, okay? And so, so for breakfast you could do, for example, you know, like I said, eggs with some vegetables, a quarter slice of good nutty, grainy, seedy toast, and, um, and some, um, I just forgot, blueberries, you know, five blueberries or whatever. Or you could do an egg with some avocado and a little quarter slice of toast and some blueberries. What about dried like fruit, Jennifer? Dry Never fruit. dried fruit, because dried fruit concentrates the sugar. So you take all the good stuff out of the fruit. The good thing about fruit is the liquid and everything else that's in there. And so you take it all out by drying it. So we say never, ever, ever dry fruit. It's too concentrated sugar. I tell the kids raisins are poison. And I'm like, no, they're not. And I'm like, yes, they're poison. <laughs> <laughs> so they're poisoning me. And, the, um, and mm -hmm. some people, I mean, I don't know if this is controversial. I, you know, there's a debate about fat bombing. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I don't like those. You want your fats to be natural and in your diet. Right? So, so again, you want to try to put it all together, you know, so, so maybe that's some cheese with your meal. Maybe that's, you know, some olive oil that you've cooked in. Maybe that's, you know, a little butter on the toast, you know, or some avocado, you know, you want to really vary it up. Those fat bomb things are just not natural. So to me, I'm like, what's the point of that? Now, occasionally, you know, I will make, um, you know, those, I take a little bit of coconut oil and some peanut butter and I make it into little balls and then I roll it in. Um, dried oats, like steel cut oats, and freeze them. And that can be a little bedtime snack because it will hold your blood sugar stable. It's got complex carbs in the oats, it's got the fat from the peanut butter and the MC or the um, coconut oil, you know, and it's got the protein from the peanut butter. So sometimes, occasionally, I'll say, you know, if you really have to do something on the go, that's a nice little on the go. But it's, it's mm. not something I would do on a regular basis by any means. And then the whole idea of completely withholding sweets uh, to me is just, it's not feasible. In this world like sweets are everywhere you can't possibly protect your child from never having sweets and kids are very smart and if you try to lie to them and say they're allergic or you know it will make their belly sick or whatever they're gonna test you out on it by the time they're four or five right they're gonna eat a pop-tart or they're gonna eat a cookie and they're gonna go well, I didn't die <laughs> and then you're screwed because right? you've just told them that what I, you know now you've taught them I lied yeah. you know, and you don't want to do that you know yeah. so what you do want to do though is to say this is what's good for your body this is what's healthy this is how we eat and I really make it about the whole family this is how we eat with our family our family eats healthy you know and and so we don't eat that because it's not good for our bodies it's not nourishing food needs to be it means something it should always mean something mm. you know so I tell kids if you're gonna do a treat in school like if everyone else is having cupcakes dark chocolate covered strawberries is a lovely treat dark chocolate not that bad for you it's not super sweet right it's got a little bit of a bitter taste if you do like the 70 percent or above cacao and a strawberry which you're allowed to eat two dark chocolate chocolate covered strawberries your kids in heaven right i mean that's a great treat um or you can take some fresh fruit and make your own whipped cream with heavy whipping cream and no sugar you know just whip up the whipped cream and that also is a very nice treat for most kids because they don't ever get whipped cream you know and so and we know whipped cream tastes sweet but they don't know that whipped cream tastes sweet you know and so you can put a little vanilla flavoring in there or cinnamon or something to give it a little flavor but again you say this we make this ourselves we don't buy it and the reason we don't buy it is what we buy in the store is unhealthy and as kids get older, especially like your son's age at four or five, you can show them the list. On the heavy whipping cream, there's one ingredient. It's cream, right? Mm. And if you look at the cool whip container or whatever, there's like 50,000 ingredients. And, and so to me, it's a really good lesson for everyone to learn is we want things that are more natural with less ingredients. It's better for us. When we do cheat, when we do have a piece of cake or we do have some ice cream because we're on vacation, it's because we're, we're making a decision to do so. And there's a reason. It's a special occasion. And, and yes, it's not good for you. It's not good for any of us. But we've decided this one day, this one time, we're going to do this mm. as a family. And because you can't take away all special occasions, it's not fair to anybody, you know. And you don't want to make your kid be different at, you know, the party, you know, or whatever. You're going on vacation and you all want ice cream and he can't have ice cream. That's just not fair, mm -hmm. you know? So I say just explain it. Just really explain it. And again, once kids are getting older, eight is when I show that picture I showed of the insulin and I start to talk to them. I want you to really listen to your body and pay attention to your body when you eat that ice cream. You tell me how it feels. And their inevitable answer is always, the first answer is, it feels great. I'm like, no, 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 no. It tasted great. 
how did your body feel? Well, I felt more hungry and I was more tired. I'm like, right, that's what it did to you. So you really sort of want to breathe that insight because it's super important for success. You know, um, when we were sitting here before Elizabeth Ruth was talking about a kid that, and she said, well, he has insight that's so rare. I don't think it's rare at all. I think we as parents have to teach insight to our kids. Like, this is what, why we're doing this, you know, you have to learn it, you know, I mean, it's just as if your child had diabetes to me. You're teaching them this is how you have to live. It's your life, the end, right? I mean, it's the hands you were dealt. Mm. Yeah. Mm.